very happy to be actually to be presenting on this subject because it is one of my absolutely favorite subjects. Um, and there's a reason for that. And I think the reason for that is because um, it's a subject that seems to have gotten lost. Um, no one knows about these women. And so I always feel whenever I'm speaking about them, I feel like I'm kind of almost writing a, his, a writing a historical injustice. So uh, without any, any more introduction, I'm going to dive right in. Um, and uh, I understand that there will be about 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Um, so starting with Emmanuel Ringelblum, can you all see my, you can all see my slideshow, but without the notes, correct? We're good? Cyril, are we okay? Yes, we are. Okay, terrific. So this is Emmanuel Ringelblum, and I want, I think what he says is important because he says it in May 1942. Um, he's in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he's already thinking about posterity, and he's thinking about the future historians and what they will need to write about in order to present the entire story of what happened in the Holocaust. And he wrote, the future historian will have to dedicate an appropriate page to the Jewish woman in the war. She will take up an important page in Jewish history for her courage and steadfastness. Now, he's not He's not referring specifically to the resistance, to women in resistance at this point. He's referring to women in general. So our story is kind of a subset of the story of women in the Holocaust and what they were able to accomplish for a lot of different reasons, because of who they were, because of what they were. Um, and that is Emmanuel Ringelblum on the topic. But in order to understand, because we're gonna be talking about armed resistance today and the part that women played in armed resistance. And so in order to understand armed resistance in the ghettos, I'm going to give you a little bit of context by showing you a clip from one of the films that Yad Vashem has produced in the not so distant past um, about resistance. Um, and it will give you a little bit of a taste and an introduction to what I'm talking about. When the German army invaded the Soviet Union and the Nazis began to systematically murder the Jews, youth movement couriers risked their lives to reach the isolated ghettos with this information. Most Jews did not believe the rumors. It was difficult to imagine such brutality. Yet, the leader of one of the youth groups in Vilna, Abba Kovner, instinctively understood that the Nazis intended to ruthlessly murder all the Jews of Europe. He called on the youth to take responsibility. Jewish youth, do not trust those who are trying to deceive you. In front of our very eyes, they tore our parents, our brothers, our sisters from us. Hitler is plotting to annihilate all the Jews of Europe. Let us not go like sheep to the slaughter. The only response to the enemy is resistance. Brothers, it is better to die as free fighters than to live at the mercy of murderers. Resist to our last breath. Why did Kovner turn specifically to the youth? The young men and women in the youth movements were teenagers. Like all teenagers, they believed they could change the world. Before the war, they saw themselves as educators and leaders taking responsibility for the future. In the ghettos, this idealism continued. They organized meetings, keeping up morale despite the grim reality of ghetto life. They assisted the community by caring for the children and creating soup kitchens. They also organized illegal activities, such as educational seminars and importantly, underground newspapers. They believed in mankind. They still believed that they could fight the Germans and shape the future through education, morality, and spiritual weapons. Now, faced with mass murder that made the future an illusion, they understood that they would need more than spiritual weapons to fight the Germans. They were ready to die fighting for their ideals. Kovner's pronouncement reached the Warsaw Ghetto, hundreds of miles to the east. Warsaw was the largest ghetto in Europe. At its height, over 450,000 Jews were trapped inside, desperately struggling to survive. Youth movements there hesitated at first, but as reports of extermination filtered in, 
they began to realize that it was only a matter of time before mass murder reached Warsaw. Okay, um, so what you understand from that film is that, first of all, we're gonna be talking a lot about youth movements and we're talking about the women in those youth movements and why are youth movements going to play such a large part in this? Here again, you see Abba Kovner, who is a member of one of the youth movements in Vilna and Abba Kovner starts to understand, he was a very young man in his early 20s and he starts to understand pretty quickly that the Germans are going to murder all the Jews. It was like a gut instinct that he has. And so he came up with this pronouncement um, let us not go like sheep to the slaughter. Brothers, it is better to die as free fighters than to live at the mercy of murderers, resist to our last breath. But there are a lot of problems with that message because even though he had the best of intentions, how is that message going to be spread? How is he going to actually recruit people to this struggle? How is this going to all happen? Who's gonna put it all together? And that's where the youth movements come in and that's where the women come in. This is, by the way, in case you're curious, I won't play it for you, but Abba Kovner did read that pronouncement at the Eichmann trial in uh, 1961. Um, so where the goal is armed resistance, the women in youth movements are going to play a key role. And why are the youth groups so important? Youth groups are gonna be very important, first of all, because they didn't begin as fighters. And this is actually something that's kind of counterintuitive to us um, because we're talking about armed resistance, but these people did not begin as fighters. They began as educators and they really did hope that through education, they could create a better world. It was one of these very ideological, very lofty goals that they had. Um, and at the time that they begin to sense that things are changing and the German occupation is going to spell death for the Jews. What they're going to do is they're going to have to, they're going to have to switch. They're going to have to have that complete change in their, in their persona. They're going to have to become fighters. And this was not really in their nature. Not only are they going to have to become fighters, but they're going to have to do a lot of things in order to fight. You also have to get weapons. Uh, and that's going to become a major problem for them. So the youth movements are also going to be key here because they grew up together. The people in youth movements grew up together. They trusted each other. And trust is going to become a very important issue because unfortunately in the ghettos, you never knew who you could count on, who you could trust not to turn you in um, for a, a financial reward or for food or for that type of thing. These youth movement people grew up together. They grew up together in the units, um, in the movements. They had the same ideology and that developed a whole system of trust. So that's where, that's the genesis of this whole thing. I don't think any of this could have happened without this background of youth movements. And this is the youth movement called Akiba in Krakow, um, in Poland, and you can see how this is starting to change. This is Dolik or Aaron Liebskin in November of 1942, who basically calls a, this was at an Oneg Shabbat. Um, the members of this youth movement were very traditional Jews. They wore white shirts on Friday nights and they got together and they sang songs. Um, they lit candles, they did brachot. Um, and Dolek Liebskin in, nine, in November of 1942 is trying to kind of crystallize the youth movement and, and letting people know what the plan is here. And this is when they have already started to understand what's happening and they have come to the conclusion that there's only one way to respond to the Germans and that's to try and fight back. And what he says is from our road, there is no turning back. We are fighting for three lines in history, if only to show that Jewish youth did not go like sheep to the slaughter. So you see here something that's really interesting when you compare it to the first slide that I used, Emanuel Ringelblum, the future historian. And here Dolek is talking about, we are fighting for three lines in history. These people are very aware of the position that they will hold in the annals of Jewish history. And that is why they understood completely that they were not going to defeat the Germans. That was not even a question. But you hear what Aaron Liebskind is saying here. 
We are fighting for three lines in history, if only to show that Jewish youth did not go like sheep to the slaughter. In other words, this is a question of legacy. We're gonna fight as much as we can fight, but we, we know that we will not win, but we're doing this because we need the future Jewish youth to know that you have to resist, that you have to stand up, that when you have an enemy like this, you have to do something about it. And so that's what you, that's what you hear. That's the message that you hear. There are a lot of problems with this message. Um, and that's what we're gonna do now. Let's go through step by step what are the difficulties going to be of armed resistance in the ghettos? I'm sure you're already thinking about this and you're coming up with some of them. The first difficulty is going to be isolation because the Jews in the ghettos are very much cut off from each other. And that was something that was purposefully done by the Germans. They understood that if you isolate people, it will be harder for them to resist. They, people in Warsaw don't know what's happening in Vilna, don't know what's happening in Lodz. The people in Lodz don't know what's happening in Bialystok. If you create confusion and you cut them off from each other, it's going to be that much harder for them to tell the story, to resist, to get in touch with each other. So this was done very purposely by the Germans. Here you see the wall going up around the Warsaw Ghetto on the left and a map of the ghetto on the right. The ghetto ghettos were usually built in areas, very, very poor areas of major cities that was also done on purpose. Um, this is a picture of the wall in the Warsaw Ghetto. And we know from a lot of the people in the ghetto who kept diaries and left written work behind them that they felt like hunted animals because of these walls. They felt isolated, they felt cornered, they felt trapped. And this is also something, this is the psychological effect that these walls will have on the Jews in the ghettos that will make it even harder for them to resist because when you're beaten down that way, it's gonna be very hard for you to think of anything else but standing up, getting food. And you, we also, of course, we have to take into consideration the fact that in these ghettos, there was tremendous starvation and there was hunger and there was disease. And we know we often cite the number of 184 calories as the number of calories that people in the Warsaw ghetto were getting. You can't live on that amount. Um, so again, in terms of your priorities, when you are starving and when you have to worry about feeding your family and clothing your family and how do you get heat for the winter, these are going to be your priorities, not fighting back. So the Germans were, I don't want to use the word clever, but you understand all of this was planned out, was thought about, the overcrowding, the demoralization, the fact that you're fighting for space, the fact that you, you have no privacy in a... The, the average number of people living in every room in a ghetto like Lodge or like Warsaw was usually seven to nine people. So in one corner, you've got a family starving and in another corner, you've got a baby that's crying and in another corner, you've got somebody who's sick from typhus and all of this leads people out onto the street. It creates a feeling of, of, of lack of being human. So the first thing that these people have to do in order to resist really is get their humanity back. Okay, they have to remember who they are. But then even once they do that, take a look at the map. Abba Kovner is in Vilna when he makes this pronouncement on January 1st, 1942, or the night of December 31st, 1941. Take a look at the fact that from Vilna to central Poland, first of all, there are borders that have to be crossed. I mean, that little area that's kind of a yellowish color on the map is called the general government area. And that was a next, not a next to Germany rather, but it was, um, it was an area that was governed by Germany without being a next. And it became kind of the trash can. Um, it became the area that all the Jews were sent to under the Nisko plan. But it's, it's, you have to cross a border to get from there to Vilna because Vilna was in Soviet occupied, um, the, the Soviet occupied uh, part, portion of Poland. Um, as it was distributed between Germany and Russia in the Ribbentrop-Molotov agreement. So how are you going to get that message all the way from Vilna into central Poland, where the biggest ghettos are? And this is going to be a big problem. And these are just some additional difficulties. First of all, what are you going to use for weapons? We're going to talk about that at length. Caring for children, parents, or other family members. Again, these people are starving. Um, they're, they're cold, they're dying of disease. 
you have to get past that. And I think one of the reasons why youth movements become so key here in this issue is because they don't, they have, sometimes they have much more of the freedom. They themselves don't have children yet to care for. Sometimes their parents are already gone. They've been taken away. They are basically free um, or unfettered by all of these other concerns that most of the people in the ghetto have to deal with. The danger of collective punishment for the ghetto population is going to be a big, big problem because you know, we know that that was one of the things that the Germans loved to do. The Germans loved to collectively punish not one person, but 50 people at a time as a warning to everyone else, don't do this or. And when you have the fate of your family, your community on your shoulders, that's gonna be a very big decision. Should we stand up and fight knowing that this could mean punishment for the entire ghetto? That's gonna be a big, very big problem for these youth movements. Denying the threat of death instead of facing it, this is something that sounds so illogical. How could they deny the threat of death? And yet, as human beings, that's what we all do because that is our fallback. That's what saves us sometimes. We have this hope that everything will be okay. And we're gonna speak more about that as we go through the slides also. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll cut that short for a second. All of these things all together are the factors that are going to prevent active physical resistance. Um, so I want to play you, now we're gonna start, now that you understand the context, I want to play you a, um, a piece of testimony from the Eichmann trial. This is Rivka Liebskin Cooper. And if the name Liebskin sounds familiar to you, you already heard her husband, Aaron Dolek Liebskin in a previous slide with the three lines of history. Rivka Liebskin Cooper was married to Dolik. She manages to survive a long story, um, makes Aliyah to Israel and was one of the witnesses who testified at the Eichmann trial. Listen to what she has to say about what they were hearing and who they called on. You'll hear her say, our girls, who they called on for these missions. Very early, learned after the first deportations, we heard rumors about the direction of those deportation trains. And then we came to a decision that we cannot go and be slaughtered like sheep. We cannot stand with folded arms and look on as our parents or children, brothers and sisters were taken away from us and not do anything about it. Of course, it is easy to relate now, but it was very difficult at the time. The first thing we did after we learned the aim of those deportation, deportations were to send warnings, warnings to all Jews, our girls who had any way or means by their Aryan look to leave the ghetto would go out of the ghetto, get in touch with other ghettos. I did that as well. We used to come to ghettos and get in touch with the people we know. The danger was great. It was dangerous during the war to approach a stranger but through those acquaintances, we sent word to everybody. We sent word where those tra deportation trains headed for. So you hear Rivka Cooper saying, Rivka Liebskin Cooper saying, once we understood about the deportations, we sent word, we called on our girls. Who is she talking about when she says our girls? She's talking about the women that we're going to be speaking about today. She's talking about the people who we call the couriers in English, which doesn't do them justice at all. In Hebrew, the term is kashariot because they were the kesher. They were the people who connected the ghettos, connected the communities, and they really were a lifeline for news, for information, for morale, for supplies. For arms, they are really a personal inspiration. So we're going to get into all of their stories because these are just unbelievable stories. 
and everyone should know these stories and they we shouldn't have really we shouldn't relegate them to the dustbin of history so this is Vlad Gamid um, just um, just introducing Vladka you'll see her a lot this is her fake ID in the name of Stanislava Varshalska as you can see she was born Feigele Peltel um, and in Warsaw and later became Vlad Gamid that was the name that she took on um, and I'm going back to Emanuel Ringelblum again because I think he sums it all up. He says, these heroic girls, Chaika and Frumka, they are a theme that calls for the pen of a great writer. Boldly, they travel back and forth through the cities and towns of Poland. They're in mortal danger every day. They rely entirely on their Aryan faces and on the peasant kerchiefs that cover their heads. Without a murmur, without a moment of hesitation, they accept and carry out the most dangerous missions. Is someone needed to Vilna, Bialystok, Lemberg, Kovel, Lublin, Częstochowo, or Radom to smuggle in contraband, such as illegal publications, goods, money? The girls volunteer as though it were the most natural thing in the world. They undertake the mission. Nothing stands in their way. Nothing deters them. How many times have they looked death in the eyes? How many times have they been arrested and searched? And there you see Frunka Plotnitska, Frunka was called the mama, and we'll talk about her a lot more also. Um, this is again, Emanuel Ringelblum is writing this in May of 1942. So what is he talking about? Who are these women? What is it that they're accomplishing? Why is he so, why is he admiring them so much? And this is the, this is the, the photo that we have in the Yad Vashem Museum. And these are three of the careers, Tev Schneiderman, Lanka Kujibrotska, and Bella Chazan. There were many, many more. So who were these girls? And I pardon, pardon me for using the word girls. It's the word that Rivka uses in her testimony. And I think some of them actually were girls. And that's why it's kind of quasi legitimate, at least, to use the word girls and not women. Some of them were as young as 14, 15, 16. Um, and most of them were probably in their 20s. So who are these women, these girls? First of all, most of them will be active in or leaders of youth groups. Um, there's an ideological spark. There's a commitment to the ideals of their movement. Like I said, they started off as educators. And for many, the group becomes a surrogate family, again, because many of them, in, during the course of 1942, many of their parents are taken away, their siblings are taken away, they find themselves without family at all. And so the youth movement that they belong to becomes a surrogate family for them. Um, they were very passionate about this. They were very, they had a lot of pride in what they were doing. And in this picture, you can see a leadership seminar for the Shomer Tsair in Warsaw. If you look very, very closely, you can see Janusz Korczak, uh, who was the, a master educator, um, sitting at the, towards the bottom of the picture in the middle. Um, so that's one of the things about them. Another thing is they're women, they have, they look like Aryans, okay? They, a lot of times they have the blonde hair and the blue eyes, and of course this is going to be very helpful because they're going to be using false identities to go from place to place. You saw Vlad Gamid's false ID card. Um, what else is going to be important? Not just the way they look, but the way they speak. And without belaboring the point, many of these women grew up in the Polish school systems. We know that young Jewish boys at the time were getting their elementary educations in Cheder. They were speaking Yiddish. They were not out in the wider society. They were kind of very much within the, within the bubble of Jewish society. The girls a lot of times were educated in the Polish school systems. Why? Because it was less expensive. And if your parents were enlightened enough to send you to school, they were going to send you to a school that, that cost less, um, not to get a lesser education, but because it, there was less of a priority in sending girls to school. So many times they picked up the Polish, they picked up the Eastern European language, they spoke it without an accent. They spoke it without those, that Yiddishism, that, you know, the, the, the telltale signs that you can hear. Um, and their mannerisms and gestures were also local. Anyone, the best example that I can give you here is in um, um, Inglorious Bastards, pardon, uh, pardon me, um, in the movie, where if you remember the barroom scene, there is a scene where three Americans are pretending to be German officers and they order three glasses of whiskey. 
They order it like this instead of doing it like this, and that's an immediate tip off. Their mannerisms, these girls had to have mannerisms and gestures that were local, that were authentic. You have to know how to cross yourself. You have to know how to pray in church. You have to know all of these things that will, that will, tip, that will not be tip offs to people who are trying to find you because there are always people who are trying to sniff you out. Most of them, again, in their teens and early 20s, they had chutzpah. And what do I mean when they say they had chutzpah? They were very cool under pressure. Um, and they were, their bearing inspired men to be very chivalrous. They could bat their eyes. Sometimes they had these big eyes or a very, a beautiful face. And that goes a long way. Um, they were flirt, they were flirtatious when they needed to be. And many of them actually, the, the advantage that they got from this was that they were able to con their way into getting German officers who they sat with in a train compartment or who were checking them at a border, got them sometimes even to carry their bags that were full of contraband. So they were very cool under pressure. This is again, Lanka Kujibrodska, this is her fake ID. Her friends used to say that Lanka wouldn't burn even in a fire. That's how cool she was, okay? So just as an example. And a final advantage that to, of women as couriers, First of all, they don't have the physical handicap. I'm gonna call it a handicap in this particular context that Jewish men do. They were not circumcised. So they had no telltale signs on their bodies that they were Jewish. You remember that in these times, if, a, if someone on the street was suspected as being a Jew, if a German tells a man, drop your pants, then the jig is up. Um, women didn't have this problem because they have no telltale signs on their bodies. But in addition to that, one of the things about women is that the way they are brought up, they are very attuned to nonverbal cues, um, very attuned to somebody staring at them for just a little bit too long, or um, somebody looking at them the wrong way, attuned to, um, to body language, attuned to, to distinguish in a baby's cry whether it's hungry or whether it needs to be changed. All of these things are a question of upbringing. Um, and so women uh, were very good at this and they were very responsive to all of these cues and that made them very good cur couriers. So now having said, having said who they were and what were their attributes, what was it that they actually did? We know that they went between the ghettos. Um, they used their fake IDs, they used their faces, the peasant kerchiefs on their heads, but what were they doing? So. The first thing that they're doing is they're relieving isolation, okay? And how are they doing that? This is, you know, bringing hope to people. Um, this is Chafka Fulman Raban, who was a courier from Warsaw, and Chafka lived to tell the story and wrote a book afterwards called They Are Still With Me. She says, one of the most difficult concerns that filled the hearts of Jews was the feeling that the entire world had forgotten about us that we had no hope and certainly no future. This was loneliness and all its horror. With meager abilities, we young women worked to ease this feeling of loneliness so that it would be less suffocation. We let them, the Jews in the ghettos, know that they could be, depend on contact and activity. And that's very important. That's a question of morale. And like I said before, restoring humanity, okay? So this is Tosha Altman. Tosha uh, was one of the founders of Hashomer HaTzair in Warsaw. Um, and when she came, it's like a holiday. Tosha came, it was a blessing of freedom, just the information that she came. It spread among the people as if there were no ghetto, as if there were no, was no death around, as if we were not in this terrible war. A beam of love, a beam of light. So you understand the incredible impact that one of these couriers getting to the ghettos was. And this is Lanka Kujibrodska again, all of our women liaisons were like Lanka. Her arrival in the ghettos was a holiday for the members of the movement. They surrounded her in awe, and she told them about Jewish youth unwilling to accept the humiliation imposed upon them. Jewish youth who dreamed of a better life or even of a more noble death. Um, so that's hope. Another very important uh, responsibility of these women was forged documents, procuring them and also getting them to the places where they needed to go. They disseminated secret information, newspapers, underground materials, and they also encouraged armed resistance, as we know. So again, Chafka says, 
I, as all the other couriers, carried on my body the makings of history and the preservation of history at one and the same time. When I was assigned to carry some special material, I felt exhilarated. I knew that immediately after I left, the members of the group would read the entire collection. What they read would give them strength. They would then begin searching for a more dynamic way to go on. These women are bringing very important information to the ghettos, again, the isolated ghettos that are cut off from each other. The best example of this is Vladka Mead. This is Vladka again. Vladka actually managed to smuggle a map of Treblinka out of the ghetto, out of the Warsaw ghetto in her shoe. And she got that to the Polish underground. Um, and that was a very important step, at least the underground thought it would be a very important step in making the world aware of what was happening to the Jews in these ghettos. So they are um, bringing information. Another thing, a uh, very important thing that these women are doing is they are connecting the commanders of the underground to the non-Jewish underground and also to the partisans. Take a look at this map, which we have in Yad Vashem, and you will see again Frumka and Tosha Altman on the bottom. Just take a look at how many borders they crossed. Take a look at the trips that they made. They were crisscrossing the area of the greater German Reich. Remember that every time they crossed a border, they were taking their lives in their hands because border crossings were particularly dangerous. You have to show your ID. You have to be inspected. What happens if you have guns? What happens? How are you going to get around that? They developed all kinds of strategies. Sometimes they hid in the bathrooms of trains. Sometimes they got off and then got back on. Sometimes they made friends with the people who were sitting in their compartments so that if somebody came and inspected and was a little bit too harsh, their gentleman friends would say, ah, she's fine. You know, there's no need to inspect her. They had all kinds of, strat cults, all kinds of stratagems. So in addition to all of the things you've seen until now, another very important fa factor, another very important element um, in these women's roles was their reporting about the reality of the deportations and extermination, not just to the Jews in the ghetto, but also to the outside world. Um, Frumka traveled, and you saw the map, she traveled to so many Jewish communities, and she saw so much annihilation, and so many deportations, that she started to refer to herself as the grave digger of the Jewish people. And these are just some photos from the town of Rubyeshov, where Frumka and Chavka together witnessed the deportation. Now I have a very long quote from Chavka's book that describes what they saw. So I will read it relatively quickly. There were eyewitnesses. Suddenly a horrible scream of a woman is heard followed by a shot. A woman with a baby in her arms keels over. She wanted to throw the baby over the fence in the hope that it would be spared. But a moment, a moment later, she and the baby are trodden to death by the horse's hooves. A deadly silence descends on the platform. I hold fast to the windowsill. I feel terribly dizzy. We start walking into town. The road is crowded with carts bearing old and sickly people who are unable to walk to their destination. They are guarded by the Ukrainian police. Upon approaching Rubyezhov, we become aware of an unusual commotion. Big crowds gathered on the platform. Unsuspecting, we alight at the station, but we learned that the thousands heard there were Jews, men and women, old and young, children pressed among bundles of household effects, cries and shouts of the Germans. A huge German with the face of a murderer leads off four youths clad in capotes. Their faces are frozen. A few meters from the window of the waiting room where Frumka and I took refuge, they are ordered to dig. They are urged along with a whip. Quickly, we have no time. A few minutes later, four shots are heard, and again, the whip is used on those who are bidden to fill in the open grave. We are allowed to look our fill. Only a trifle is required of us, a smiling face. Are we not supposed to be true goyim? And is not spring in the air? In the center of the town, two Germans walk preceded by a group of Gentile boys. The Germans carry axes. The boys are leading them to a house where Jews are hiding. In order not to draw attention to ourselves, we quicken our pace in the direction of the church. In a shop, I learned that the Jewish youth has been concentrated back of the town. They are intended for the labor camps while the rubbish will go elsewhere. This remark by my informant is accompanied by a sly smile, which I have to return in kind. The next morning, a special train stands on the platform, filled to overflowing with Jews. The platform is strewn with bundles, pillows, prams, and pots and pans. A number of Gentile boys are waiting. As soon as the train steams out, they will appropriate the loot. So this is Chavka's eyewitness testimony 
of this experience in Rubyeshov, and this leads me to the next subject. She then, she and Frunka then have to go back to the Warsaw Ghetto and make people aware of what they're seeing, of these deportations, of the fact that deportation leads to extermination, to annihilation. And this is going to be very difficult, again, because of that denial that I was speaking about before. Chavka writes, we returned to Warsaw and described what we had seen. To our friends, this was the first reliable information about the deportation of Jews from Eastern Poland for extermination. I felt like they did not want to believe us. That was the first and last time during the course of the war that I cried. I was so stressed, I could no longer take the tension. I also told my parents what I had seen. I remember my father's eyes. He refused to believe it. It's impossible, he insisted. So these, it falls on the shoulders of these young women to break the news to the people in these other ghettos as to what is going on. And not only are they going to report, but they are trying, going to try and take action. Sometimes they will smuggle Jews out of the ghetto. Many times children, here Vladka writes in her book on both sides of the wall, she writes about the anguish of the mothers whose children they smuggled out of the ghettos. Sometimes the mothers didn't agree to smuggle their children out of the ghettos, but they did whatever they could. I'm not gonna dwell on this because there's so much more to say. The most important role, uh, well, before we get to that, there's also distribution of food and medicine and money to Jews in hiding. Um, I'm going to skip on ahead because really the most important thing that these women did in terms of armed resistance was to get guns and ammunition and smuggle them into the ghettos. And why was this so important? You can't fight without this. You cannot stage armed resistance without this. Vladka says, this is, was the goal for which they endured constant danger and hid like frightened animals. And just to give you an understanding, when the decision was made to fight the Germans, there was one rifle in Bialystok, one revolver in Vilna, two in Warsaw, and not a single gun in Krakow. So how are these people going to fight? They have to get guns. And the couriers are going to be the all important link in that chain. They are the ones who are going to bring the guns into the ghettos, whether they have to travel 500 miles or 800 kilometers. They bring the guns into the ghettos. Sometimes they have to wrap them up like birthday presents. Um, this is Chaika Grossman, who later made Aliyah to Israel and became a member of the Knesset. She, and she says, can I describe Gedalia who's trembling with joy, with the delight of the future battle to which we would no longer go empty handed. This is the all important goal. Branka Klibanski, who also was a courier um, between Bialystok and the partisans, uh, worked for a time at Yad Vashem, liked to smuggle things into the ghetto in a, um, a loaf of bread. That was how she smuggled in pistols. One of the most important things that she did was she smuggled out of Bialystok the whole archive of the Bialystok ghetto that was written by Mordechai Tenenbaum Tamarov, um, and she had to find a place to keep it safe. Um, Hella Schupper, uh, who also worked from between Warsaw and Krakow, five pistols that were taped to her body and explosives and bullets. Um, and one of the crazy things, and this I believe was a conversation between Tema Schneiderman and Chavka Fulman Rabban, um, definitely Chavka, um, when, they would, when they would be on trams, you know, where were they hiding these things? You see that Hella put these things, she taped them to her body underneath her clothes. But many times they had grenades in their underwear. And one particular tram ride, um, two of these female couriers were talking and they said, you know, the worst thing that could happen now would be if some, gent some gentleman stood up and wanted to give us his seat because how would they be able to sit down with grenades in their underwear? So, you know, all of these, all of these problems, there are so many problems of being a courier because your life is at risk all the time. The biggest problem is fear. And this is again, Vladka, the common denominator of Jewish life on the Aryan side, because most of these girls are living on the Aryan side and not inside the ghettos. They, they were in and out of the ghettos, was fear, fear of the Germans, fear of the Poles, fear of the blackmailers, fear of losing one's hideout, fear of being left penniless. 
There was a constant companion, not only of those because of their typically Jewish appearance had to keep out of sight in Gentile lodgings, but also of those of us who had the Aryan features, fair hair, blue eyes, snub nose, which meant the chance to move about the streets. These so-called Aryans had to blend with their surroundings, adopt Polish customs, habits, mannerisms, celebrate Christian religious holidays, and of course, go to church. They had to watch their every movement, lest it betray nervousness or unfamiliarity with the routine, and weigh their every word, lest it betray a Jewish accent. I would just remind you of one thing here. These days, it's very common for women to have their own apartments, to be living without their families, without a roommate. It was not, that was not so in the 1930s and the 1940s. And these women had to many times if they were working um, outside the ghetto, they had to invite their colleagues from work over their non-Jewish colleagues. They had to have Christmas parties so that their landlords wouldn't be suspicious of them. You know, this is on top of having to go to church and know the prayer and know how to cross yourself. You have to do all of these things around, um, around this essential character of, uh, of a non-Jew because they're playing a part and they cannot afford for someone to get wise to them. Vladka says, how could one hide the mute melancholy, the haunted look of fear? Your eyes give you away, our gentle friend, Gentile friends would tell us. Make them look livelier, merrier. You won't attract so much attention then. But our eyes kept constantly watching, searching the shadows, glancing quickly behind, seeing our own misfortune and foreseeing even worse to come. Haunted by fear of betrayal, our eyes betrayed us. And this knowledge only increased our fear. Why were they so afraid? Why was it so difficult to be a courier? Again, they're playing a role. They have to be the consummate actresses. They have to have nerves of steel. And this is a, a beautiful quote from Justina's narrative. Gusta, um, or Justina, as she was known in the underground, Davidson Dranger, was another of these couriers who worked out of the Krakow ghetto. And she has this amazing quote that she wrote, um, and her story really needs to be turned into a movie. All of these do, I think, because she wrote this story on reams of toilet paper while she was in jail in Krakow. She was caught um, and imprisoned, uh, and it's a whole amazing story. But she writes, how do you manage to sneak out of a ring of barbed wire surrounded and closely guarded by police? How do you take your first step into the outside world? They'll see the armband on your sleeve. And you can be sure that a bullet to your head will follow. Should you remove the armband? As soon as someone notices that white symbol sliding down your sleeve, he will betray you and deliver you into the hands of the police. Then perhaps you should try to slip into the blackness of the darkest doorway and there undertake to remove the ornament adorning your arm. No matter how dark that doorway, there will always be someone who notices that you stepped into it a Jew and stepped out as if you were a human being. Why is it a human being? Because to take off the armband successfully, you have to first regain your sense of human dignity. Without that, you are nothing more than a Jew without an armband. You would reveal your Jewishness in a thousand small ways. Every anxiety-filled move, every step taken with a back hunched over from the yoke of slavery, every glance that bespoke the terror of a haunted, anim haunted animal, the entire lack of form, the face on which the ghetto had left its mark. You are nothing more than a Jew, not only because of the color of your hair, eyes, skin, the shape of your nose, the telltale signs of your race. You are simply and unmistakably a Jew because of your lack of self-assurance, your way of expressing yourself, your behavior, and God knows what else. You are simply and conspicuously a Jew because everybody outside the ghetto strained to detect your Jewishness. All those people eager to do you harm who couldn't abide the thought that you might be cheating death. So this is very important. You cannot, if you do not think of yourself as a human being, you're not gonna be successful as a courier. And I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. I see that we are very quickly running out of time. So I'm going to skip to this slide, just to illustrate this, having to be the consummate actress. This comes from the movie Uprising, and it's a very short clip. How close are we to the plant? A couple of blocks. You're lucky. Lucky? Most people that go to that guard shack don't come out. I think this is where you take your armband off and leave us? Going to turn me in? No. Behave. 
Misha. Misha, it's Kajik. I couldn't get close to the gate. It wasn't safe. So I had to follow your wagon. Come, walk. Walk, sorry. Blackmail is up ahead. We need to laugh. Laugh? Yes. Jews look dumb. Jews look sad. Jews avert their eyes. Blackmailers can smell fear. So, can you laugh? <laughs> Try again. <laughs> no, you do what you do it big like this. <laughs> I said. So you hear him say to her, keep practicing. Um, this is the problem, is that you had to laugh when you wanted to cry. And this is going to be the problem for all of these, for all of these women. Um, it's a very difficult position to be in. There are a lot of difficulties. Um, and I want to start wrapping up now. So I'll just show you the fate. Because what happens to these girls with all of these incredible difficulties that they're in? Um, I hope you all can hear me because I'm getting a strange message on my computer. Um, but what are the fates of these couriers? First of all, we're back to our three. Um, Tema Schneiderman was captured in Warsaw during the, the uprising in January of 1943 and was killed in Treblinka. Um, Lanka Kuzibrodska was captured as a Pole. She was trying to smuggle in a large quantity of cash and also four pistols. And she was caught on the border, interrogated, and sent later to Auschwitz. She lasted for about five months in Auschwitz and actually died in the arms of Bela Khazan, who was also sent to Auschwitz. You can see by the triangle on their uniforms that um, the Germans did not realize that they were Jews, because otherwise they would have had a yellow triangle uh, going the other way. Um, and Khafka, also sent to Auschwitz, does manage to live and survive to tell the tale. So I'm going to close. I just want to, I just want to show you, and, and you know, these women, the ones that I talked about just now are stand-ins because most of these couriers did not live to tell the story. Fromka Plotnitska was killed in an uprising in uh, Benjin, and Tosha Altman was also killed um, after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, um, just to mention a couple. Antek Zuckerman, who was Mordechai Anilevich's right-hand man uh, during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, says, the girls were invaluable and their sacrifice was infinite. Without them, it would definitely have been impossible to maintain the movement through the German occupation zone. All of them and every individual, according to her ability, risked her life and demonstrated unimaginable loyalty. I asked myself where they drew their strength what sustained them? So I want to try and answer that question, and that is how I will close. This is Lisa Chapnik, who was a, a courier in Bialystok and dealt a lot with the partisans. And she says, I should say that each step of the Jewish women on the Aryan side was extremely risky and dangerous. We seem to have lived on the verge of disaster, to have walked on the edge of a blade. We all assumed that none of us would survive, but it was our moral duty to fight the Nazis, to avenge our parents, and our people. And Sylvia Lubetkin says something very similar. There wasn't much hope, but people believed in what they were doing. Young people together somehow are not afraid. It was absolutely clear to us that if we did nothing, the entire Jewish community of Poland would have been murdered without uttering a cry of protest. This realization gave us strength to not simply kill ourselves in despair. And I want to show you Sylvia again at the Eichmann trial very short clip that answers the when you started this uprisal did you know how it would end did you have a hope of conquering the german Witness. army no we don't, did not have a fighting chance it was clear it was in april 1943 there were only the first beginnings of the russian victories on the front it was quite clear to us that we did not have a prospect of winning in the accepted sense of this word, the military sense of this word, or the more accepted sense of this word, victory. 
but believe me, it is not a phrase. In spite of their strength, we did know that eventually and finally we shall be the winners. We, the weak ones, because that was our strength, our belief. We believed in justice, in man, in another regime than that which they professed. So it was a very lofty goal again. We believed in justice. They still had their ideologies. And I will wrap up with this last slide. As we began, I am going to leave it in the hands of Emmanuel Ringelblum to, to sum up and give him the final word. The story of the Jewish woman will be a glorious page in the history of Jewry during the present war. And the Chaikas and the Frumkas will be the leading figures in this story. For these girls are indefatigable or indefatigable. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for listening.